Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about some of the work that we've done looking at long-term outcomes after autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, just to begin with some disclosures, um, I'm currently a full-time employee of Bristol Myers Squibb, but I was not at the time that this work was done. Uh, I am also on the board of directors and on the medical advisory board for the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance. In today's talk, uh, I'd really like to convey some of the domains that may be affected long-term after autoimmune encephalitis and help, uh, help everyone to recognize the significant healthcare costs and the personal and family impact that is imposed by autoimmune encephalitis. One of the questions that I get asked frequently is how common is this disease? Um, you know, there are only a handful of incident studies uh, looking at autoimmune encephalitis across the world. This is one study that we're working on currently looking at the incidence of NMDA receptor encephalitis specifically across New York City. To do this, we used a rare epilepsy database that has cataloged neurology nodes and EEG reports across five centers in Manhattan and the Bronx. Uh, we uh, identified 15 cases over the five year study period. Uh, accounting for potentially missed cases, such as those who may not have had seizures during their clinical presentation, and those who may not have received care at one of our study site hospitals, we estimated an incidence of 0.18 per 100,000. So I get asked frequently, if this is so rare, why is this an important area of study and, and why should people care about long-term outcomes after this disease? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, first of all, seizure burden is high. Um, and we know that suboptimally controlled seizures in individuals with epilepsy, for example, can result in negative effects on cognition, mood, and long-term functional abilities. And the same is likely true for individuals with autoimmune encephalitis. In this study, we sought to uh, quantify the burden of seizures um, in the autoimmune encephalitis uh, group. And to do this, we did a systematic review looking at the literature uh, on seizures in this disease. And what we found was that really across all types of autoimmune encephalitis, uh, up to about 75% had seizures at some point during their hospital course or their initial clinical presentation. Uh, and close to 90% had abnormalities on EEG. These numbers were really relatively uh, similar across the different encephalitis types, of course, with vari variation depending on the particular associated autoantibody. We tried to identify reasons why some individuals may have seizures and others may not. And one thing that um, seemed to, to hold true was that age seemed to be associated with seizure prevalence. So what we found was that the younger individuals, particularly those in the adolescent age, uh, were more likely to have seizures, both across all comers of autoimmune encephalitis and within the NMDA receptor encephalitis subgroup in particular. Another reason why this is an important area of study is the cost burden associated with care for autoimmune encephalitis patients. In this study, we looked at length of stay um, and hospital charges uh, across patients with autoimmune encephalitis and found that the median length of stay was about 15 days and the median hospital charge per patient was close to $75,000. Uh, interestingly here, so not surprisingly, as the length of stay and the ICU length of stay increased, so did the charges associated with care for that individual. We then sought to compare these findings uh, of patients with autoimmune encephalitis to those uh, who had were admitted for herpes simplex encephalitis. And what we found here was that our individuals with autoimmune encephalitis had longer lengths of stay um, for within both the ICU and non-ICU admitted patients, uh, and also had a significantly higher hospital charge per patient. So where the median, as I said, was nearly 75,000 in the autoimmune encephalitis group, it was closer to 20,000 um, in the herpes simplex encephalitis group. Uh, what we saw here is that looking over time through the study, the, in the blue line, you can see here that the charges for uh, herpes simplex encephalitis patients really remained stable over time, where the total charges per patient uh, seem to increase over our study period for individuals with autoimmune encephalitis. And this is likely a reflection of the uh, increased testing um, that we've been able to do for these participants, as well as the, the medications that are used, um, which can be quite costly. 
Recently, there's also been emphasis on trying to understand what some of the social determinants of health are in individuals with encephalitis. And so in this study, we looked at uh, uh, both all comers with autoimmune encephalitis, as well as the uh, anti-NMDA receptor subgroup um, across our uh, patients at Mount Sinai in New York City, as well as at Columbia and Cornell also in New York City. And we found a few trends here um, that I think are worth noting. Uh, we found that when we looked at uh, Black individuals, their Glasgow Coma Scale scores on admission were significantly lower than uh, those who were not white or those who were white. Um, we think this may reflect uh, uh, delays to accessing care for these individuals. We also saw that length of hospital stay was longer for individuals who were Black and for individuals who were not white as compared to those who were white. When looking at interval from the hospital admission to diagnosis, we found that those with public insurance and those who were uninsured experienced longer intervals. And similarly, when we looked at hospital length of stay, those who were uninsured experienced longer lengths of stay as compared to those with private and public insurance. And this likely reflects the, the issue of disposition or, or trying to figure out how to safely discharge patients home um, or, or uh, out, out of the hospital. Um, when they do not have insurance. As we've seen in many of the talks today, um, and as many of you are probably aware, aware, most of the research within autoimmune encephalitis really has been focused on identifying autoantibody mechanisms, improving diagnostic techniques, and evaluating different immunotherapy strategies. And I think really we're moving into the forefront now of uh, improved understanding of comprehensive and long-term outcomes after these diseases. One of the most pivotal papers uh, in this space uh, is this paper from Martin Titulera's group published in 2013 that looked at disability outcomes in NMDA receptor encephalitis specifically. They used the modified Rankin scale uh, scores here uh, and noted a score of zero to two as a quote unquote good outcome and a score of three to six as a poor outcome. And what you can see in this figure here is that the number of individuals who had this good outcome increased until about 18 months, at which point it, it uh, seems to plateau. And I think this is where um, the convention has come that uh, we, we tell patients and families to expect a, a long recovery process, but that recovery potentially can be good with up to 80% having good outcomes at a year and a half. Um, I think there's a few limitations to this study though. Uh, one is that a good outcome includes a score of a two here, which is unable to carry out all previous activities. Uh, and I think that while this is certainly a huge improvement from where patients come to us in the hospital, uh, you know, to have a young adult who's no longer able to do the things that they used to do um, certainly can, can be challenging and, and pose problems for patients and their families. Second of all, this score does not consider the cognitive, behavioral, or other symptoms that patients present with. So it doesn't really capture uh, what is happening to those domains. And then I think finally, this study has been perhaps inaccurately extrapolated to other forms of autoimmune encephalitis where we don't necessarily know that such good outcomes may be seen in those individuals. So we've done a couple of studies to try to combat these issues. Um, in this study, we just asked individuals with autoimmune encephalitis to tell us about some of the persistent deficits that they were experiencing. And what we found was that uh, more than four years after their initial diagnosis, about 50% of individuals were still experiencing difficulty with emotional ability and short-term memory, and about a third still experiencing difficulty with fatigue and concentration. Uh, quite shockingly, when we looked at the um, percentage of patients who uh, were working or at school, uh, we found that prior to encephalitis, where 80% had either been employed or in school, this number dropped down to 44%, so dropped almost by half um, uh, after their encephalitis. And again, this was more than four years after their encephalitis. As part of the study, we also looked at adaptive function, which is sort of the idea of being able to accomplish age expected tasks um, and keep up with, uh, with community expectations of oneself. 
So some, some of the questions that this tool uh, in, includes are things like relies on him or herself for travel in the community, such as you know, being able to use public transportation on their own or being able to drive a car. And what we found here was that our uh, individuals with autoimmune encephalitis on average scored significantly below the normative population, both on the total score or this uh, GAC score, as well as on each of the subdomains. The cutoff for an average score is 90. So the average score for our subjects actually fell in the below average uh, range. So then we wanted to look at how did the modified Rankin scale score um, uh, associate with this adaptive function score. And not surprisingly, as one's MRS score becomes worse, so does their adaptive function score. But what's noteworthy here is that when you look at individuals who scored in the good range for modified Rankin scale scores, um, a large proportion still scored below average on adaptive function which means that really just looking at motor disability through the modified rank and scale score um, doesn't tell us the full picture and does miss some of the uh, deficits and difficulties that patients will be experiencing. We wanted to see within our individuals with autoimmune encephalitis, what were some of the factors that were associated with better or worse scores? So we looked at a number of factors. We looked at sex, age, antibody type, time to diagnosis, time to treatment, the type of treatment received, and the only variable that really seemed to associate with uh, outcomes was whether or not an individual had NMDA receptor encephalitis. So we see here that those in that subgroup actually scored significantly better than those with other forms of autoimmune encephalitis. And, and these individuals were actually in the normal range. Uh, additionally, fewer subjects with NMDA receptor encephalitis actually described difficulties with emotional lability, short-term memory, and fatigue. So then we wanted to look within the NMDA receptor encephalitis group in particular to see what mediated outcome. And what we found here was that there seemed to be some association between the age at symptom onset and long-term outcomes, even when we corrected for the time to study enrollment. So what you can see here is that uh, the younger, the individuals who were younger at the time of their symptom onset had worse scores on adaptive function long-term compared to those who were in their early adulthood. Um, at the time of diagnosis and symptom onset. Um, this particular um, uh, um, uh, analysis was not statistically significant, I think because of some of the older individuals in the study. However, when we restrict the age group just from zero to 18 in the pediatric group, um, this analysis does become statistically significant. Put slightly differently, uh, when we look at the individuals with a presumed prepubertal onset to their illness, long-term outcomes seemed significantly worse than when we looked at those who were in the post-pubertal to young adult um, uh, phase at the time of symptom onset. Um, in another study, we wanted to look at the long-term impact on psychosocial well-being of autoimmune encephalitis. And in these analyses that I'm going to show you today, um, I'm just looking at the NMDA receptor encephalitis subgroup. So what we found here was that our individuals with NMDA receptor encephalitis demonstrated worse overall psychosocial function after illness. And you can see that here with the higher mean score. Um, and this was compared to a general population enriched for chronic illness. Um, so not healthy individuals, but people who are already battling with some form of chronic illness. Um, and then what we looked at here was different factors that mediated worse outcome. And what we found was that uh, when the individual had ongoing difficulty with sleep, seizures, or um, some sort of neuropsychiatric uh, symptom, their psychosocial outcomes were worse. Some of the domains that seemed to be most affected from pre to post illness included worrying about health interfering with my life, feeling isolated from others, and worrying about the future. We again wanted to look at employment and schooling status as we did previously, but, but delved into this a little bit further. And what we found that uh, was that of those individuals who did return to work or school, more than a quarter were receiving accommodations. And of those who did not return to work or school, nearly half were receiving government assistance. <clears throat> 
some of the factors associated with um, uh, whether an individual returned to employment or school um, was whether or not they had a misdiagnosis, which uh, was associated with not returning to employment or school, um, as well as not having psychiatry follow-up. And what's interesting here is that while 95% of individuals in this study saw a neurologist, only about a third had follow-up with a psychiatrist. Um, and of course, there are likely many confounders for this association, but I do think that it calls into, um, into uh, question um, and emphasis for us on the importance of multidisciplinary follow-up for individuals to make sure that we're really addressing all of the domains that are being affected for them after their acute illness. We also wanted to look at how we're doing preparing patients and their families uh, for the transition from inpatient to outpatient care. And in this study, the majority of individuals disagreed with the following statements. They did not feel that they had a readable and easily understood written plan for how their healthcare needs were going to be met in the outpatient world. They did not feel confident that they knew how to manage their health, and they did not have a good understanding for their health condition and what makes it better or worse. We also looked at caregiver burden in the study. Um, and what we found was that on average, our individuals um, who cared for somebody with NMDA receptor encephalitis specifically scored in the moderate to severe burden range on, the, on a caregiver burden survey. And associated factors, again, were uh, for higher caregiver burden were when the individual that they were caring for had persistent seizures, fatigue, uh, and um, neuro neuropsychiatric symptoms. Some of the items of greatest burden here were that indiv uh, individuals were afraid for what the future held for their relative. They felt stressed between caring for their relative and trying to meet other responsibilities for their family or work. And that they felt that the time that they spent with their relative meant that they did not have sufficient time for themselves. Um, and while some of these studies I think sort of um, seem obvious perhaps or seem uh, as things that we might expect to be affected for any individual who has a significant illness, I think really identifying the particular domains and the particular individuals who are likely to be struck with some of these um, poor psychosocial uh, um, well-being as well as uh, caregiver burden can be really helpful in developing interventional uh, tools. So we're working now with the Autoimmune Encephalitis uh, Alliance um, to uh, really develop some materials for physicians as well as for patients and their families that may help to address some of these issues. Fatigue is another uh, area of interest for us to look at. It's something that we hear from patients all the time following their um, illness, and it makes sense as it's something that's seen in other neuroinflammatory conditions um, chronically, such as multiple sclerosis. So in this study, um, we looked at the modified fatigue impact scale, the Beck's depression inventory fast screen, and the Pittsburgh sleep quality index and administered these to a group of individuals with both autoimmune encephalitis and infectious encephalitis. And not surprisingly, we found that fatigue was moderately correlated with depression as well as sleep quality, and that depression was also moderately correlated with sleep quality. However, the relationship between fatigue and encephalitis persisted even when controlling for sleep quality and depression, suggesting that there really is some sort of uh, true biological um, after effect for these patients. We again, again looked at a whole host of variables that may associate with who has more problems with fatigue and, and specifically fatigue um, over uh, sleep and depression. And again, found that the only variable uh, of, um, that associated here was the encephalitis type, such that individuals who had NMDA receptor encephalitis seemed to have lower levels of overall fatigue as well as physical and cognitive fatigue as compared to others. Um, and these uh, rates did not differ um, in the depression and sleep quality measures that we used. Uh, another strong area of interest for us is in improving the understanding of the cognitive effects of encephalitis. So in this study of all comers with encephalitis, uh, we administered the European Brain Injury Questionnaire to just to get a sense of what domains we should be looking at um, as being affected long-term for individuals. And what we found here was that the somatic domain was the most affected, followed by the cognitive and the communication domains. 
Um, and interestingly, when we compared our results with other uh, studies published in the literature, we found that our encephalitis uh, patients actually performed worse on this measure compared to stroke individuals in all domains except the physical domain, which makes sense because that would be where you would expect uh, stroke individuals to have more uh, effects. But this sort of suggests that some of the um, issues that individuals are facing, particularly with these three domains that I mentioned, um, are, are quite significant and, and debilitating, even more so than the stroke population, for example. So then we wanted to look a little bit more closely um, at uh, doing objective measures of cognition and um, neuroimaging as well, structural imaging. And in this pilot study, we uh, had 16 individuals who underwent a um, full cognitive battery as well as structural imaging. And what we found was that 10 out of 16 individuals scored below one standard deviation from the mean uh, on, on, um, on at least one domain. And the most commonly affected domains here were social cognition, executive functioning, and complex cognition. I only have preliminary structural imaging data to show you, but I hope that I can sort of make the case here of the individuals whose imaging has been analyzed that their, um, their thalamic volumes, putamen volumes, and amygdala volumes appear to be potentially lower long-term after their acute illness as compared to the healthy controls in the study. And this does not um, go unequivocally for all brain regions. And just to show you that, for example, there does not appear to be a difference in caudate volume between these two groups. There are certainly other groups um, who have looked at cognition and structural imaging following uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis specifically as well. Um, this is from Martin Titulaire's group as well, um, where they looked at um, neuropsychiatric debt testing, or, I'm sorry, neuropsychological testing um, following uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis. And what they found was that individuals um, seem to have difficulty long-term with sustained attention, long-term verbal memory, um, fatigue in particular. And then when they looked at quality of, uh, when they looked at the relationship between many of these domains, they found that quality of life seem to be associated with fatigue in particular, such that such as uh, when fatigue is worse, this really impacts one's quality of life. Um, there have been a number of studies um, looking at structural imaging as well, particularly coming out of the Think group. Um, in this study, they demonstrated that uh, long-term after NMDA receptor encephalitis, that hippocampal volumes were significantly reduced bilaterally, uh, and that the left-sided volumes in particular um, and as well as mean diffusivity on that side uh, was correlated with verbal memory performance, disease severity, and duration. Uh, in this study, they looked at functional connectivity and found that despite normal structural imaging in the majority of these patients during the acute period, there was widespread alterations of functional connectivity um, in the chronic period and the long-term period, most notably in the hippocampus, medial temporal and frontotemporal regions, and that memory impairment correlated with these changes. And then finally, they looked at um, superficial white matter damage and found that there were um, effects long-term in these individuals, predominantly in the frontal and temporal lobes. And again, these changes also correlated with working memory, verbal memory, visual spatial memory, and attention. Uh, in the last few minutes, I want to share some uh, uh, pilot work that we are doing looking at changes in language um, throughout the course of illness, um, particularly in NMDA receptor encephalitis. And to do this, we uh, use natural language processing, which is a form of machine learning in which subtle patterns and changes within language are analyzed. And we were fortunate to work with some colleagues at IBM um, to do the analysis for this data. So this technique has been used to predict or correlate with clinical features in many disorders, including schizophrenia, psychosis, and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, working with some of our psychiatry colleagues at Mount Sinai, um, they, they've used this tool um, in, a, in a group of uh, kids and adolescents who are at clinically high risk for the development of psychosis and found that these models have been able to predict the onset of psychosis with an accuracy of 83%. So what we did for this study was uh, collected uh, writing samples from individuals with NMDA receptor encephalitis at various time points prior to and following their hospitalization. 
Um, we then took these uh, 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 writing samples, uh, anonymized them, and uh, used the natural language processing to, to divide these writing samples into 36 parts of speech tags. Um, and then also looked at how the words associate with each other, which is a concept called semantic coherence. We then ran several models to look at, um, the, to compare the different writing sample time points. So for example, we compared one year before to three months before, and then we compared one year before and three months before to one month before hospitalization. And we repeated this process 25 times, looking for different time point gatherings that led to the greatest uh, differentiation. And through these models, we were able to categorize time points into three sets. A pre-illness uh, set, which was defined as the um, uh, 12 months prior to hospitalization. Um, a hospital, uh, an acute illness phase, which is three months before hospitalization to 12 months after hospitalization and a recovery phase, which was 24 months following hospitalization. After understanding which stages of illness the samples represented, our next step was to understand how accurate a natural language processing model would be at correctly classifying random samples from pre-illness and acute illness stages. And then we wanted to look at which aspects of language really drove the accuracy of these models. And so looking at this here, um, we were able to find a model that predicted um, with 68% accuracy uh, whether a particular writing sample fell in the pre-illness or acute illness um, period. And some of the driving features of this model uh, were determiners, which are words that attach to a noun um, to express the reference of the noun. So things like the, a, my, some, um, as well as adjectives, third person singular verbs and possessive pronouns. And then our final step was to understand how accurate an NLP model would be at discriminating between pre-illness to recovery in order to determine how lasting these changes in language are. So, um, you know, the, the idea of um, is there recovery in language or are there long-term deficits that are seen? And the best model we could find here really only predicted um, with 50% accuracy which, uh, which time period a, a random writing sample was in. And so what this tells us is that while there do appear to be predictable and consistent changes in language between pre-illness and hospitalization, there really may not be as consistent changes in language between pre-illness and, and um, recovery, suggesting that recovery in language um, really may occur um, prior to two years. Um, our next steps here are to try to understand um, the differences in these language features that we see um, in the study as compared to other disease populations such as psychosis, to understand how the changes we see associate with clinical symptoms, um, and potentially to consider um, natural language processing in the, in the diagnostic evaluation of individuals with NMDA receptor encephalitis. And so I think much of the work that has been done at this point by our group and other groups really has been sort of cross-sectional retrospective to understand what are the domains that we need to be looking at in these individuals. And so our next steps from here really are to think about prospective multi-site studies that would assess the trajectory of symptom development and improvement. Um, there are groups working on establishing clinical guidelines and potentially even rating scales for the monitoring of symptoms long-term. Um, and ideally, we would love to create an outcome measure that may be utilized in future clinical trials. Um, I, I think one of the goals of many of these clinical trials um, is to identify sort of modifiable features that are associated with differential outcomes, because if we can predict what some of these features are um, and can modify them, we can improve patient outcomes across the board. And so with that, I'll stop. Um, I have a long list here of people to thank who've contributed to this work that we've done. Um, I've also included two pictures of, of patient, prior patients of mine whose cases and whose families really drove um, the, the questions that underlined a lot of the work that we've done. And then of course, thank you to the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance for their support and um, encouragement of their readership to participate in many of these studies. <laughs>